Whooping Crane Chronicles is a collection of stories to learn from, to ponder, and to celebrate. I'm Mike Forsberg, a conservation photographer from the Great Plains. I've spent the last five years, camera in hand, exploring the natural history of whooping cranes across the continent, meeting the people who love them, and discovering how these tall, magnificent, and rarest of cranes are navigating our 21st century world. This podcast elevates conservation stories and uplifts these birds to showcase their natural history and beauty in the hope of keeping these birds around for generations to come. Join me on the journey. So hi folks, this is episode one of the Whooping Crane Conk. <laughs> you can tell why it's episode one because carnivals. I cannot pronounce <laughs> chronicles. It can be carnivals or carnivores. <laughs> chronicles, uh, Whooping Crane Chronicles. And today I am joined by, let me see if I can get this right, Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, non-game bird biologist, and didn't you say there was a specialty in it now? Piping plover and least turn specialist. Okay. Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, non-game bird biologist, piping plover and least turn specialist with a lower S. Yeah, like lowercase lower S. S. <laughs> and my very own daughter, eldest daughter, Elsa Forsberg. Nice to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um. Yeah, I don't know where this conversation is going to go today, but we can sort of set precedent here because over the next year or so, we're going to be talking to a lot of different people that have had connections with cranes and especially with whooping cranes, which has been a project I've been working on for the last five years. And now it's time to pull the curtain back. And you have been with me to see whooping cranes maybe more times than just about anybody, anybody else. And... To start off the, the show or the episode tonight, I wanted to read to you something that I wrote out of my journal. So I've kept journals every day. I've been in the field pretty much over these last several years. And the only problem with me writing journals is that I can't read my own writing. So, you know, I don't know if I can even read this one. But I'm going to try because it says I can see your name in it. It says Elsa. Aww. So it's November 1st, 2022. Halloween Eve, Elsa and I raced out of our respective classes at Hardin Hall on East Campus and hopped into my truck and we sped away, leaving school behind and as we said to each other, quote, going on a whooper hunt. Remember that? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> This has been our tradition on Halloween since she was in late grade school when she asked me if she could go watch cranes rather than go trick-or-treating. She never much liked Halloween or candy, so I took her to Roe Sanctuary that year on the Platte River, and we slid into the North Blind with our snacks and drinks, and frankly, I was not expecting to see any cranes at all because it's really hard to see cranes in the fall on the Platte. And we had a family of three whoopers fly right past our blind window at sunset. And that sealed our fate. We have tried to go see cranes on Halloween almost every year since. And when I wrote this, you were 24 years old. Hmm. What do you remember about that first time we saw those birds? I remember, yeah, I never really liked Halloween. And I remember going and it just felt kind of exciting. I was like hanging out with my dad going on little adventures. I think it was a full moon, too, or at least close to it, because I couldn't find it, but I remember, like, writing a poem about it. <laughs> 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 like, white bird, white moon, like, something like that. But, yeah, much better than Silly Halloween. And, I mean, whooping cranes are, like, kind of ghosts anyway, in they their are, own way. Yeah, they're so. like great white spirits floating out there. yeah. And, like, the ones we see today are kind of like ghosts of the past uh -huh. in a way. But they're not really ghosts anymore. Right. They're alive. 
Yeah, and they're coming back. Yeah. So let's back up a minute. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit, or tell our listeners out here a little bit more about you and your, <laughs> I know what your origins are, oh. <laughs> but your your love of birds and how you got to where you're at today as the, uh, what do we call you, the uh, non-game bird biologist. Okay. My origin of birds. <laughs> Well, obviously, I grew up uh, in a pretty nature or wildlife conservation conscious family. Your green book was in process and coming out when I was a toddler, maybe before I was born. I've been told my second word ever was crane. That's true. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that's just environmental. <laughs> right. I mean, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do going into college. I debated between like language things or environmental things and ended up doing fisheries and wildlife biology at the University of Nebraska. And I did a couple different jobs. I did some environmental education interning with the NRD at Lower Plot South. I, okay, I guess I did work at the Wild Bird Habitat birdseed store. Yes, you did. This summer before I started college. And that was always my fun fact. <laughs> if we ever had a fun fact, I worked at a birdseed store. And then I started getting more down this career track when I think it was before my junior year of college, I had a professor named Mary Bomberger Brown who had a couple technician jobs who work with the Turn and Plover Conservation Partnership. And she asked me if I wanted to apply and work with her over the summer. And I thought, I can't pass that up because I'm remembering this now. I'd already met Mary when you, I was helping you with a blind to photograph lease turns. Right. Yeah. So I knew it would be a really cool opportunity. So I was a field technician a summer of 2018, and I just had to come back and do it the next summer and the next summer after I graduated. And then after I graduated, I moved on. I did a couple different still bird-related jobs. I did try to do other jobs, <laughs> yeah. but I had experience in birds, so I kept getting hired to do bird things. Eventually, I heard about a graduate position with the Turn and Plover Conservation Partnership, that was it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was real. I wanted to work with endangered species, and I care about turn and plovers so much. Why did you, let's stop there for a second. Okay. Why did you want to work <laughs> with endangered species? I just, it feels like I'm doing something really worthwhile. Every day, the work that I'm doing, I feel like it's going towards something, towards a goal to help something that's not myself, to help the world. There's all sorts of things going on in the world, and you can do a lot of different jobs to feel like you're helping a problem. This just made sense to me. So if we, you know, if we take it back to cranes for a minute, you know, when mm -hmm. I talk to people about cranes, I'm the I'm the crane guy to a lot of to a lot of people because mm -hmm. that's just how they know me yeah. and my association with photography and and the natural world. But I oftentimes say cranes, and I talk about whooping cranes or sandhill cranes, and folks don't know that there's two. Mm -hmm. They don't know that there's a sandhill crane is the most populous in the world out of the 15 crane species. You know, there's over a million strong. And most folks don't know that whooping cranes are the rarest in the world. And when I tell them that, they go, oh. And then when I tell them that in the 1940s, there was less than 20, they're like, oh, mm -hmm. wow. And that there's, you know, 500 plus in the last wild migrating flock today coming right through the heart of the Great Plains and right through Nebraska twice a year. Um, it's really remarkable, but it, it still is hard because you want to crawl into everybody's hearts and get them to care mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the exact same way that you do. And the only way you can really do that is to, is to make it personal, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's why these, these experiences matter. So I was lucky to to be your dad and give you a few experiences out in nature, um, you know, that are things that are memories that we take with us the rest of our lives and hopefully it planted seeds for you to care in your own heart about stuff, you know, and I see you doing that now because in your term Plover project, you used to be a, a technician on that project working for others and now you have technicians that are, that are working with you. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's just nothing better than, than seeing that seeing that light go on, hmm. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. 
there, I remember there was another time that you and I saw whooping cranes. So we've, we've seen them on Halloween a few times, and we'll circle back to the Halloween story. But let's go way south. You've been talking about turns and plovers. You got your graduate degree studying those birds, but you had never seen them in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. So I was working on this book, and we went down to the Texas Gulf Coast, down to Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, and um, around Rockport and mm-hmm. all those barrier islands. We had like three goals. <laughs> or, you know, one goal was to go down there and try to see piping plovers and least turns, but piping plovers primarily. And then their second goal was to see your piping plovers. Mm-hmm. We were looking for them, and we know that they're the ones that you study on the lower plat because they have what color bands? Blue. Yeah, right, blue flags. Yeah. Yeah. Our tears of goals, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And and then our third goal was to see whooping cranes. So we checked two of those three boxes, right? Yeah, yeah. Pipe and plover, whooping crane. No banded birds, unfortunately. You could add more tears in there, too. Piping plover, period. Uh-huh. Banded piping plover. Piping plover that was one of our birds. Piping plover that even I touched it, banded it. That would right. be cool. That but... would be cool. Well, we're still going to try to do that. So, yeah, yeah I remember... We were at, I think it was Goose Island State Park, and it was the time that we saw the first piping plovers mm-hmm. down there, and you spotted them. Mm-hmm. And we walked up to the picnic table, and on the picnic table was a sheet, and, yeah. it, and it was a bird list. Mm-hmm. And it had, I don't know, it had a lot of birds like on it. Like 50 birds on it, probably. Yeah. Oh, we wrote down the piping plover, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. 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 yeah, it was in a group of semi-palms. Yeah, right. Yeah. That was really cool. And then we got to see whooping cranes. Yeah, they were right in the backyard. <laughs> that that wasn't much of a goal as a given, <laughs> I would say. Right. So we we were at Alan Diane Johnson's house. Yeah. Um, they live on a property that's right next to Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, and they've got uh, a pair of birds that come back every winter time, and their names are Yay and Nay, <laughs> and I don't think neither of them know that that's their name, but it seems like they they just fit it. You know how some people just look like their names. <laughs> I guess I see them through the lens of Al and Diane. Ye is an old female who was banded a long time ago, and she had yellow, aluminum, yellow uh, band on her leg. Al and Diane just light up like candles when these birds come back. And Ye and Nay, that's joyful names, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, those two have been coming back to that ranch for 20-plus years now. Yeah. And um, it always is right before Thanksgiving, it sounds like. And then they stay until late March, early April, and then fly north. You say, give thanks, the whoopers are back. That's right. Yeah. So another time that we were together where we watched whooping cranes, you remember another time? I know we've chased them through the sand hills a couple times. Yeah, we did. We did. What I remember is four hours of driving, listening to classic rock in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been 80s disco It pro- music, Actually, right? I think it was like cowboy country. It was probably a mix of cowboy country and classic rock. Well, We got bored, I think, of I classic have, rock and switched it. I have eclectic taste. Yeah. That's another bird that we're going to get to know through the course of this Chronicles. Yeah. And that bird's name is Brutus. Brutus was the very first bird that I saw in hand in Texas. I was with a capture and banding crew, Mm -hmm. and Brutus came in, and when he was captured, um, they discovered that he had a broken bill and a big cut, big laceration on his neck. He had either just been fighting with another bird, another male likely, or else he had just evaded some predator, but likely it it was another whooping crane. And so fortunately, the crew that were putting telemetry on Dave Brandt, wildlife biologist for Northern Prairie, and Barry Hardup, who's a longtime veterinarian for the International Crane Foundation, if you had two people that you wanted to have there with a bird that was injured, it was those two guys. And they patched Brutus up. Brutus, the reason they call him Brutus, uh, he, did, he wasn't called Brutus until he came into the trap because he's a really, really big bird. Mm. And here I am watching these guys, you know, delicately handle this five foot tall, eight foot wingspan, big bird who was injured and therefore dangerous. (laughs) 
and doctor him up, put telemetry on him, and they gave him a black, blue, black band, which I sort of thought was bruising. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Bruiser. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, and so Dave uh, named him Brutus from that mm. point. And then they let him go and they hoped for the best. Mm-hmm. And his telemetry disappeared almost immediately, and they thought, ah. you know, he went dark, and maybe maybe he died. Mm-hmm. But months later, Dave and I were out on a boat on the intercoastal waterway along the Blackjack Peninsula at Aransas, and there Brutus was with a gang of a couple other of his buddies, and he even took off from the salt marsh, and he flew right across the bow of our boat and looked at us in close range and was able to get a few pictures. And, you know, that beak was completely healed. Mm -hmm. That neck was completely healed. And almost felt like he flew by just to either show off that he was healed up or to say thanks. So he became a bird that I started following a lot um, with the help of these researchers through that telemetry study that, that is still ongoing today. And we found out that he was in the Nebraska Sand Hills. I drove up there first to to check him out and found him, and then I brought you back. And um, you know, it's just it's crazy to see a bird down on the Texas Gulf Coast and then see that bird a thousand, you know, twelve, thirteen hundred miles later in the Sand Hills. There he was eating frogs. Down on the coast, he was eating crabs, and then uh, later even saw him up on the nest in Wood Buffalo National Park, so 2,500 miles away. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty cool to share that with you because we didn't just see him there. We we saw a lot of whooping cranes, didn't we, that night? Oh, yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, I said earlier that seeing whooping cranes on that Texas trip was like a, not a goal, but a given, which is such in contrast to (laughs) to anywhere else that's not their wintering grounds. Yeah. And just like, they're right in the backyard, which is crazy. You don't have to chase them to find them or use your binoculars to see them. They're like right in front of you and you can hear them calling in the morning when you wake up. And it's just, that was really cool. Yeah. I went for a run and they're just like all around. Yeah. Yeah. When we saw them in the sand hills, I'm just remembering now, you know, we were in a very different environment, obviously, you know, there we were in a, in a land of grass, Mm -hmm. but we weren't out in the middle of some high wide prairie somewhere. We were we were out in an open landscape, but we were on the edge of a CRP field that had a center pivot, mm-hmm. um, had a cattle operation that was nearby. We were at the intersection of two county roads. And some blue winged teals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We saw a lot of <laughs> blue winged teals mm-hmm. and listened to Woodcock and, and um, all sorts of things going through. But we were in a, a working landscape. And the thing that that told me was, you know, we were watching this handful of birds and they were moving. They were eating frogs out in the wetland, Mm -hmm. but then they were moving up into the uplands and picking around in the grassland. And then they would move over to the crop field, over to the cornfield and picking through waste grain left over from previous fall's harvest and then flying back to the wetland to roost. You know, that, that landscape that they were in was not uh, anything like what the landscapes were that they used 150 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, before settlement. But yeah. the thing that, that struck me most about that is that it was just simply quiet, you know. I mean, we saw one truck mm-hmm. when we were there the entire time. Yeah, nobody else really knew yeah, they no- were there or what was going on. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think those are the places that they really look for, you know. When push comes to shove, they look for quiet. Mm-hmm. And if they're not disturbed, then they're there until they're ready to move on. And I always just think about, I wonder, God, I wished I could just talk to these birds for a second. And and what is it that they say? What is it that they think? What is it that they look at as they move from those remote summering nesting grounds to their winter quarters? And And how much that has changed for them in such a short period of time. But they are a little bit more adaptable, I think, than, than what people think. So yeah. I remember one other time we saw whooping cranes together, and it wasn't on Halloween. It was actually later that same year in late November. We went up to the Missouri River. Mm-hmm. You remember that? Yeah, Lewis and Clark. Yeah, Lewis and Clark Lake. So we were just mm-hmm. upstream from Gavin's Point Dam. and They have plovers there. See, yeah, there you go. And we stopped on a hillside 
And we had advantage again. We had telemetry. Buddy Dave Brandt, the biologist, had said, Mike, there's a really special bird up on the Missouri River right now. And that bird's name, he says, I call it Lone Juve. Hmm. Lone Juve. So what does that mean, Dave? Juvenile. Well, juvenile, right, yeah. So the backstory to that bird was that um, that bird was captured and banded on the nesting grounds up in Wood Buffalo National Park as a chick. They don't have a instinct to migrate to a particular place. They learn their migration patterns from their parents or from other adult birds that have made that pathway before. And that fall, that bird took off you know, with its parents and was seen with its parents in Saskatchewan. Um, but then somewhere along the way, it lost them. Mm. And that bird showed up without parents at Quivera National Wildlife Refuge in southern Kansas. And there wasn't any other whoopers around. And it stayed. And it stayed all winter long. Mm. It survived on its own. It was seen, I know, a few times for sure with sandhill cranes. Mm. Sometimes like we see them on the, on the Platte River in mm -hmm. Nebraska, solo birds. Mm -hmm. But that bird made it all the way through the winter on mm -hmm. its own and then somehow picked up the path with whooping cranes that were coming back up from Texas to go north and hopped on the, on the whooper highway, as we like to say, mm -hmm. and, um, and made it back up to Wood Buffalo National Park in that area in the, in the boreal forest and hung out for the summer. And then it was on its fall migration back. I guess it was its second, second fall. fall migration mm -hmm. going south. That's when we saw it. Yep. Yeah. And it was with two other birds. And one of those birds had band and telemetry on it. And so that bird, we knew just from its history, knew the way. Mm. So mm -hmm. it was with three birds, and we sat and watched those birds all day long. Mm -hmm. I remember it was one of the most beautiful days, one of those just perfect November days. Yeah. Sun, not a lot of wind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... The Santee Sioux Indian Reservation was right across on the other side. I remember that and those big heaving hills. Mm. And do you remember the uh, waterfowl hunters? Oh, and the boats. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Did they shoot anything while we were there? Ducks, I think, obviously. But... Yeah, <laughs> yeah not, <laughs> not cranes. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they they did. I mean, there was there was a lot of waterfowl boat traffic on the, uh -huh. on the Missouri during that time. That got me to thinking about, you know, these birds— Whooping cranes need wetlands, waterfowl need wetlands, mm -hmm. and they're migrating. So they all migrate together. Mm -hmm. Whooping cranes really are migrating along the same path, you know, down the continent as mm -hmm. waterfowl hunting is taking place. Yeah. Flyway. So that becomes part of their um, their environment, I guess, every mm -hmm. day. But I remember watching those waterfowl hunters. They didn't know that those birds were there, and they were a few hundred yards away. But the guys were getting out of their boat blind to go swap their decoys around. Mm. And, and I remember one guy seeing that bird, and I, his head just, like, disappeared. <laughs> like, oh, crap. <laughs> and, then, and then you saw a couple other guys sort of stick their heads up and point. And uh, that was pretty cool. I'd, I yeah. would have loved to talk to him. So. I wonder if that's a story that they tell. Yeah, I wonder, you know? too. Yeah. I wonder, too. So um, I always have a – I mean, this is a question I want to ask you because you do this – with blowers, you're doing research out there with birds that you are capturing and banding. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? How, how does, for me, I'm, I struggle with that sometimes. The capturing and banding? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the goal as a researcher is to do as little as possible for the best possible outcome, for the most information, basically. I'll, I'll put it that way. Handle the animal, disturb the animal as little as possible to get the most information that you can. So there's all of these protocols that we follow to make sure that we get in, we get out, like as quickly as possible to get the bands on, take the measurements and get the bird back on the nest or back into the environment. So the bird banding process looks a little different depending on the species that you're working with. Usually for smaller passerine species, you'll use what's called a mist net. You string it up and they get caught in the net. The biologist takes them out, puts the band on. Um, and since piping plovers nest on the ground, we're able to use the wire box that has a door on one side. We approach the nest 
and the bird leaves the nest. So they're trying to distract you. We put the box on top of the nest. So the nest is inside. So we retreat, we hide. The bird goes back on the nest. Sometimes it takes them a 360 around to figure out they can go inside the door. And at that point, then we'll approach the nest again, take the bird out of the box. And once you have the bird in hand, uh, usually we'll also take some measurements. So we'll measure the length of their leg, their beak, their wing, take a mass measurement. Um, sometimes there's different types of, types of other sampling you can do. Like we've been doing cheek swabs for genetic samples. And then to put the band on, it's basically just like an ankle bracelet, if you want to think about it that way. Typically, every bird that's banded will have a metal band with a number on it that's issued from the USGS, I believe. And oftentimes, a bird will also get an auxiliary band, so just like an additional band that is easier to identify the individual when you're out in the field and you don't have it in hand again, because that number that's on the metal band isn't very readable from far away. That will give that bird a unique combination of colors that becomes its identifier, uh, kind of like a name tag or a license plate that the biologist or anyone who's out taking photos or, or watching birds, if they see a banded bird, can report. And that can then be entered into a database and you can figure out which bird that is and it's attached to all of the data that has ever been reported on that bird. So when we were down in Texas, we saw no birds with bands. I don't believe, I think we saw just what you called naked leggers. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't yeah, have any. That's, yeah. But the difference between what you're talking about with piping plovers and whooping cranes is a matter of scale. Because, you know, mm -hmm. you're holding these birds in the palm of your hand. Yeah, I have them in one hand and I'm banding them with the other hand. <laughs> right. yeah. And, yeah. and whooping cranes is a two-person operation and, and mm -hmm. you're, it's like you've got a Labrador retriever in your lap. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know, I mean, these are really, really big birds. But the protocols, I'm sure, are very similar and, and uh, the rationale behind it is very similar yeah. too. So. Get in, do it quick, get the data, let it go. Right. Yeah. 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 And do it safely. And do it safely. <laughs> Yeah, this doesn't happen to them every day. <laughs> yeah. I always wonder then if they, you know, they kind of recognize us or something. They say, those guys, <laughs> those those guys got a little too close to me. Um, but they're fine. There have been studies to show that they survive just fine after we handle them and put bands on them and things like that. And they go on to continue and raise young and come back year after year. But that information that we get helps us help the birds even more with survival rates, fecundity rates. Fecundity? Fecundity, yeah. Well, it, that, I never knew that what that meant. That just relates to, <laughs> there's a specific way to, to say <laughs> it, and I'm not going to say it so that I'm not wrong. <laughs> but it just relates to like, okay. like how they're reproducing. Okay. Like are they reproducing enough offspring right. per female, I think. It might just be offspring per female, but fact check me. <laughs> but, you're, but you're saying that, this is, that banding birds is necessary. Putting hands it's, on these birds is necessary in order to... Just to track them over their life. By marking birds, you can track survival, do some analyses on it and modeling. And you can see what seems to help their survival, what seems to impede their survival. Are there certain traits that they have that helps their survival or different habitats? When this animal is listed, there will be a recovery goals. Mm -hmm. And that can be a lot of different things, but it's usually some sort of survival metric, that information is necessary if you want to be able to do anything about it. Yeah. I mean, I've had these conversations with whooping crane biologists mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, there's, there's so much unknown about these birds yet. Mm -hmm. You would think that it would be quite obvious they're as tall as they are and as wide as they are and as conspicuous as they are, but because they're as rare as they are, we just still don't know a lot mm -hmm. about them, especially um, on migration, mm -hmm. you know, and, and even what happens at the nest because they're up in a place that is one of the most remote, true wild wildernesses left on earth. And, uh, you just don't know a lot, but the data that's coming back now from the telemetry, mm -hmm. um, is helping fill in a lot of those gaps of knowledge and the bands that are put on these birds allow us to see them as individuals. Mm -hmm. And I know that can be a trap, 
for some <laughs> where, you know, you feel like, well, you're, you're anthropomorphizing and, and so forth. But I don't buy it, frankly. You know, a lot of people will argue with me about it. But these birds, they, they do have their own distinct personalities and their own ways about them. And I've seen it, you mm-hmm. know, and I can't. I can't give it to you in some statistical analysis, but I've, I've seen it and I know it. Yeah. And so I, I guess the question, though, that I pose to some of my biologist friends is when do you know enough is enough? When do you have enough data? You know, when do you have enough knowledge? Mm-hmm. And then when can you walk away from that and take what you know and just go, you know, and put that knowledge on the ground? And there's no right or wrong answer to any of that, but I think it's always important to. Yeah, no. Talk about it, right? Well, that is a big question because all of these banding efforts are funded by something. Yeah. And that money, you want that money to go towards something that's going to be worthwhile and Mm -hmm. important and get information. So why are you putting that money into your effort versus another species or a different part of their life history? Right. And with banding, I mean, we've asked this question with the Turn of Plover Partnership. We've been banding birds since 2008. And that's a 15 plus year data set. And you could say that's a long time. There's a lot of studies that do banding that will do it for two or three years. The argument there, why do you keep banding? And I assume this would be similar for whooping cranes. You know, we started because they're in trouble and we need to be able to track them. Sure, they're getting better, maybe, hopefully. (laughs) Piping pullovers are stagnant, but anyway. Um, A long term data set is pretty rare. And you can continue to track trends over time. And also, especially when you're working with endangered species, one thing that's important in science is sample size. If you have an endangered species, your sample size might not be very large. So the more data that you have, the more you can do with it. Right. Those are generally the arguments that I would make there. So I didn't expect us to talk a lot about this tonight, but I'm glad that we are. Technical side. (laughs) Yeah. So that is the technical side, and we're talking a lot about science and the mm-hmm. process and, and the thinking behind it. Um, me, being your dad, mm. <laughs> I, I know that you're a really good scientist, and you're good at all of that side of it, the, the analytical part. Um, oh, shucks. But I also know that story matters mm-hmm. to you. You write a lot. You draw. You all sorts of things that are creative and I've seen you operate in that space where you're you're just you know you just you want people to care and you'll reach them any way you can as a scientist with your scientist hat on Hmm. can you talk a little bit about the value of of story and making this personal I'll tie back to what you said about talking to people about what's the difference between a whooping crane and a sandhill crane and the history of the whooping crane. And you want someone to care. And humans are built on story in a way. And that can be a way in. And I've, you know, I've seen that day to day, not only with the stuff that you do and get a lot of people to care about the species you work with and the landscapes, um, but also just in my day to day with turns and pullovers as well. And we have one bird right now who, not anthropomorphizing, but she has a couple different names (laughs) that are not her band numbers. (laughs) Uh, One of which is Old Lady Crandon because (laughs) she's 12-ish, 12-plus year old bird. So we banded her as an adult Mm -hmm. in 2011, I think, uh, 2012, which is more than double the average lifespan of a piping plover. And... uh, just with the banding, we know that she shows up at the very same beach in Miami, Florida, every winter. Then in the summer, it's come back to the Lower Platte River over and over. And this year, she decided to nest at a mine, a uh, sand and gravel mine, where we monitor at least turn and piping plover nesting. And there's a lot of activity. They're done mining. They're converting it into housing development. So there's a lot of contractors, things out there who need to know where the birds are how long are they going to be there and where they can go, where they can't go. So everyone's paying attention to these birds. And I'm only there once a week because I have to visit right. so many different birds. Yeah, like six, 65 <laughs> over the, nests or we something, We had about right? 60, yeah, 68 is the recent count. But the contractors and guys working at the mine are there every single day. And we've had a lot of storms this summer. So 
I got a message one day. I knew it was storming in Fremont that morning, so I was not in Fremont. <laughs> and I got a message from one of our contacts at this mine, and he said, six inches of rain, hail the size to crack the windshields on our pickup trucks, wow. and that bird is still on the nest. Wow. And <laughs> I first just thought, yikes. <laughs> Yeah. And that's incredible. Yeah. We, I mean, it's hard to know exactly how many nests are lost to storms, but to keep that nest safe and secure, she has to sit on it the entire time and hope she doesn't get clocked with a hail ball. And thankfully she didn't um, because she then went on to have the moniker Hail Mary (laughs) (laughs) given to her by that, that gentleman. And she also, you can tell... Well, this is just an, a personal observation. I think she knows what she's doing because every time we'd go check on her nest, she's all up in our business, <laughs> but not super aggressively. She's just kind of like, hey, she gets really close. Some of them are a lot more skittish. Uh-huh. She gets really close and just says, excuse me, are you done yet? <laughs> in bird code, of course. Right. And she went on to hatch four chicks that I've seen now to be three weeks old as of this last week. Wow. And, I mean, she's she's a story. And that was the end for these guys, too, because every week we would go visit. Some other contractor would come up and ask us what we're doing and say, I've seen that bird on the nest. And they asked me questions. Well, what is, is that a kill deer? No. Yeah. And, well, this is what, who she is. Actually, she goes to Miami every winter. And they say, oh, that would be nice. <laughs> say yeah probably would but she has to fly there all by herself and they say that's crazy that little bird yeah and it's yeah, i it's mean a, that's that's just one example that's but, a doorway you know yeah you just open that door yeah. and there's by banding these birds you know we get stories about them like that so you said she goes to miami is she on miami beach or is... not yet no but I, but yeah. that is where she winters though that's where she winters. and do you yeah. have somebody down there that that so sees her we've got her reported a few different times by a few different people. Yeah. Yeah, just through the email threads that are sent out to some plover biologist somewhere in the country that eventually makes its way to Isn't that Joel. crazy? Yeah. yeah. And you said she's 12 years old? At least. So she's traveled all those miles. Over and over. Yeah. Yeah. That gets me to think about back down in Texas a few years ago, Liz Smith, who's another person that we'll talk to down the road that you've met. Liz is a uh, longtime biologist, lifelong Texan, and uh, I was down doing work at Aransas, and Liz called me and she said, Mike, I'm looking at a bird out on Cavasso Creek, which is off the highway near Rockport, um, on refuge property, and she said, it has a band, but it's just a single aluminum band, Mm -hmm. and I can't remember if it's on right or left leg, doesn't matter, but... She said that that bird, because of that band, and that being the only band on it, um, was a bird that had to have been banded back in the late 70s, early 80s. No way. So that made that whooping crane 40-some years old, Mm -hmm. at least. Wow. And... I got to, you know, so I watched her, first mm-hmm. of all. I drove out there and and, um, and watched her, and she, you know, good for good for her. She had a really good, young, strapping big male with her. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she walked like an yeah. old lady. Is that a whooper or a cougar? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, you said you had a bunch of jokes to yeah, tell. Yeah, that's so not I'll, even I'll on make my it, list. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do one on the way out here shortly. Uh-huh. Um, but... You know, I, I watched her, and she was a little bent over and a little stiff. But man, she was still out there. And I thought, well, if she let's let's just say she's forty years old, mm-hmm. five thousand miles round trip on migration between Wood Buffalo National Park and Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, up and down the heart of the Great Plains. So, five thousand times forty <laughs> is two hundred thousand miles that bird has flown, and yeah. At least, and imagine what she has seen and the stories that she has to tell. It's a lot of life. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. Well, would that make her like a second generation from the 1940 flock? It could. It could, yeah. yeah. 
So I, I wonder about her, wonder if she's still out there today. But yeah. um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, anytime you're talking about wildlife and, and uh, an endangered species today, you're talking about it in the framework of a world that is full of us. Yeah. So. Yeah. When we're looking at species today in this changing world with all sorts of habitat modifications and human presence, climate changes and all that sort of thing, and you've got species that already threatened and endangered, the only way they're going to survive is through conservation work and research and also their own adaptability. I mean, they have survived this long. <laughs> and I mean, whooping cranes, you say, have some adaptability. Piping plovers are evolved for some level of adaptability. They live in a very dynamic ecosystem, at least here on the Lower Platte River, where habitat changes from year to year and across years and within the year. I think that there's tipping points, though, too. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, and so it's it, we we always have to look back and then look forward. Yeah. You know, it, it, the question I always come back to when we're thinking about species and endangered species, so it's wearing that badge, but the goal is to get that animal off of it. Yes. And how do you get it off? Well, yeah, a lot of it's up to them, I guess, to continue to be as resilient as they can to make a life in a 21st century world that is dominated by us. But the other part of it is we have to care enough in order to help them do mm-hmm. that. So, you know, all research is funded. Money just doesn't come out of the sky somewhere. And mm-hmm. that funding is dictated by politics and, and policy and and what people care about. So... You really have to operate at that level, too, where you have to tell the stories of these birds and that they require, just like we do, um, you know, habitats in order to survive. Their home is oftentimes our home, too. So if you look at cranes, it's, you know, cranes require grasslands and wetlands, healthy grasslands and wetlands to survive. So do we, you know. You can say that about any... um, any creature on the planet with any home that they have is, is in some way, shape, or form uh, attached to our home. Um, really, the, the question I always get back to is, what do, we, what do we want it to be? What is the world that we want to live in, and, and who's in it? Because yeah. we get to decide, Yeah. You know, to a point. And I would say, when I mean, we talked about resiliency, the resiliency only goes so far. If you want them to be there, the habitat has to be there. One of the biggest reasons for any of them being on the endangered list is loss of habitat. Yeah. 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 And that's that's very apparent in both of the bird species that we are talking about. You know, mm-hmm. you're talking about these birds making a life on sand and gravel mining operations or something that's in the certain stage of development, mm-hmm. you know, that's transitioning from a mining operation to a housing development. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about birds that are migrating and spending the majority of their their cycle of the seasons um, in us. Yeah. You know, the entire Great Plains of North America is on a grid. You know, it's one of the largest industrial agricultural complexes in the world. It's a powerhouse. And on the coast, it's one of the largest industrial petrochemical complexes in the world. The Gulf and, Coast. Yep. Yeah. The only true wilderness that they have left to make their lives, and they they require a lot of room, is clear up north in Wood Buffalo National Park up in Boreal Forest above the 60th parallel, where there are no roads. Mm -hmm. There is no development. You know, 150 years ago, the the core of the Whooping Crane's nesting range was the prairie potholes of North America, Mm -hmm. primarily in the tall grass prairies. Hmm. So Iowa, wow. southern Minnesota, the eastern Dakotas, mm-hmm. southern Manitoba. And the only reason these birds probably survived is because at the very edge of their native range, hmm. there is this population way up north. Wow. Which are the birds that, you know, were the, the ones that held on. Yeah. So... I like to think of whooping cranes and cranes in general, and and I guess a lot of birds as geographers with wings, you know, because they are reading the surface of the land that's giving them cues about where to go, how to navigate, to find food, to find shelter, to find safety, where are we going to sleep, where are we going to eat, where can we do it without being disturbed. 
which is a lot like us. So let's see. Well, I want to circle back to one more little Halloween piece and then Mm -hmm. um, have you offer up a joke. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Don't get your hopes up too high. (laughs) Um, The last time that we were out on Halloween looking for whooping cranes, I don't think we went out last year. No, we did. It was last year. Yeah. Yeah, So this is the story of last year. There was another family of birds that I got to know because of their bands. It was birds called the church family. Mm -hmm. And I had first seen this family up on the prairie in Saskatchewan in the fall a couple years prior. And I called them the church family because the wetland that they were in roosting during migration had the little town of Marsland right behind it. And the little town of Marsland had a big high steepled Catholic church there. And it was reflected in the pool of water that they were standing in. So I've always called them the church family ever since. Well, when I saw them up in Saskatchewan, the chick of that year was pretty small little guy, uh, but he was he was doing okay. And and uh, mom and dad got him down to Texas, all right. And um, during the course of his growth down in Texas, he had got captured and banded too, and he got a call sign. His name was Two H was his number and letter. And with the telemetry then, we were able to follow his story, saw how he migrated up back north to Wood Buffalo with his mom and dad. But right before they got there, he peeled off, which is what whooping cranes do after the end of their first year. They don't go with mom and dad anymore. They go off on their own. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're off on their own for three or four years as teenagers, basically, that find each other and they hang around in these teenage gangs and mm-hmm. sort of do whatever they want until they reach sexual maturity. So... This was 2-H's first summer on his own. He bounced around between the prairies and the boreal forest. And on his first migration down in the fall, we were watching him on telemetry. And that piece that I read out of, the, uh, out of my journal when we started all of this was uh, the bird that we went out to go look for. And mm-hmm. so <laughs> what we ended up doing, you and I, is we drove from Lincoln we left here, the uh, mm-hmm. School of Natural Resources, Harden Hall, and well, we drove uh, west to York, mm. and then we, we hung a left and went south, and we ended up by the little town of Bruning, yeah. and uh, you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and there was a, uh, I mean, it was just, you know, one of those, again, perfect, perfect evenings, and um, there was a little flood control reservoir that was there, and um, I remember the telemetry would ping in once an hour, and it pinged in, and we were sort of racing sunset at the same time, you know, and, and it, it pinged in about 20 minutes before sunset, and we knew that we were close. We went and um, went to this flood control reservoir, it was, um, public access, and we walked up to the dam, mm-hmm. and we didn't see the bird. Not right away. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, where the heck is it, mm-hmm. you know? And I turned around and started walking back to the truck, and you said, Dad, I see it. And so we got back in the truck, drove around to a better location, and we watched that bird, and it's and it had a buddy with him. Mm-hmm. And um, we watched that bird go to roost, um, sort of standing amongst the, the old stand of flooded cottonwood trees, you know, not too far away from it. And um, I remember we were looking at the moon, um, Jupiter was out, and we could see the moons of Jupiter, uh-huh. and it was a glorious, um, glorious night. We put those those birds to bed, mm-hmm. and um, and that bird, two H, um, I've seen that bird again. Very healthy one, and, and his mom and his dad are still raising new generations. They just had another chick that they took down to Texas and back up to Wood Buffalo this year. Mm. So it's uh, all things connect. And then do you remember what we what we did on our way home? We went to that Runza. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went I to wasn't going to say that, but then you said it. So <laughs> yeah, you got to you got to have a Runza to polish off the the evening of uh-huh. looking for whooping cranes. So um, yeah, anybody out there that doesn't like Halloween, you know, go look for birds and, and if you're in go Nebraska, go get a Runza. Right. <laughs> yeah. So almost every Halloween, I made it a point to be home so we can go watch birds somewhere. And that, that egg of an idea was hatched 
that first Halloween back when you were in grade school. But uh, the last several years, the focus has been on whooping cranes. And since 2019, I've been working on this story and this book and this project. So the thing is, which is really fortunate for us, is that in Nebraska, Halloween, sort of that stretch between the last week of October and the first 10 days of November is sort of the sweet spot for when whooping cranes on migration are coming through the central plains, you know, and we got this thing that we do. So <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty good deal. I think it's just cool that it has worked out so many times and it's kind of it's one of our things. <laughs> I don't know. It's very unique. That's for sure. Do you ever get tired of me carrying a camera around? No. Or it's like, put the damn camera down, Dad. I honestly don't. No. Because then usually that I just get to stand and like stare at something or like <laughs> gaze at like, I don't know, take, I'd like just to take it in. So you're taking in something too. It's just through a lens and making something out of it. And I just get to observe. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes be camera caddy. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I find it hard to observe without a camera, which is mm. something I have to work on. Oh. Be in the moment without capturing the moment. Yep. Right. I don't really I mean, people always are like, Do you take pictures? I'm like, Well, sometimes with my phone. <laughs> hey. Yeah. But and I've sort of been reflecting on that in recent years in the life that you live and the career that you have and being who you are. You've always just been my dad. Not everybody's parent has a career like this where you get to chase your passion and you've really built everything that you do on your own with a lot of hard work and um, the connections that you forge with people and with what you're doing. I mean, you so obviously love it. And I think it has set a great example for me and my sister. If you care about something and you want to do it, you go do it. But now I've never felt like there's been any sort of naysaying about anything I've ever wanted to do. And uh, it's definitely been pretty great. <laughs> I don't know. What to, I can't. I don't know. Thank you, honey. Yeah. I'll give you my last cookie. I still have one in the eighth. <laughs> Are you going to like push me out and... When I can't walk anymore and still go. As long as you can that. hold that camera. Okay. And get me into the best blinds. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sounds no. good. Got a few years left. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Well, I've really appreciated talking with you tonight. And it was sort of weird talking across a table into a microphone with your dad. I think this is the first <laughs> time we've ever done this, but made it pretty easy. You, um, you've got a really dry sense of humor. And mm. uh, you're very punny. So, you got any jokes? That leads right into my jokes, yeah. <laughs> I had to, I was coming up with them all day. Really? <laughs> yeah. You should have told me to shut up so you could just what? tell jokes. It would be a, probably a lot more interesting than listening to me yap. What do you call a whooping crane that works at an ice cream store? I have no idea. A whooper scooper. <laughs> <laughs> what? All right. What do you call? <laughs> are we going to rate these? <laughs> oh, there's so many of them. Well, Carly says uh, 10. So okay. producer Carly says 10. Grant, he's, at a, he's at a seven. Not, he's not as impressed. <laughs> they get better. I, uh, I hope so. <laughs> what do you call a whooping crane that saves the world while wearing a cape? I don't know. Super whooper. <laughs> What <laughs> some of these are really niche, but I'll skip them. <laughs> what do you call a whooping crane that enjoys chowders and stews? This is what you've been doing all day. It's another super whooper. <laughs> <laughs> here's a here's a really good one. No, wait, wait. a minute. Now you got you got you got two more. Oh. Well, three. Now we're gonna okay. rate we're gonna rate these three. Oh, okay. It's like Letterman's top ten what list. Do you... <laughs> What do you call a whooping crane that likes to swivel a large ring of plastic around its torso? A hula whooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a four. No. <laughs> okay. What? Two more. <laughs> what do you call a whooping crane that works for a Darth Vader? <laughs> 
a storm whooper. <laughs> That's a 10. Grant says 10. No, I have a better one. <laughs> what do you call a whooping crane? Who's a... <laughs> it's the power of science, folks. What do you call a whooping crane who collaborates? Uh, sorry, start over. Okay. What do you call a whooping crane who's a rap artist that collaborates with Martha Stewart? <laughs> 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 well, that's whoop dog. <laughs> All right. You telling me that, that's not a ten? <laughs> that is. Oh, those are classic. I got a whole list. Those are classic. Well, I'm sure. I could I, rapid fire these out right now. <laughs> I'm sure they can probably go in the notes of the podcast, can't they? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Give yeah. credit to my technicians. They did help me. Today. <laughs> <laughs> really? right. Yeah. So we did on our drive back today. Well. <laughs> Oh, man. Way to end. So um, <laughs> thank you, Elsa. Yeah. Very much. Thank you. And because um, I'm your dad, I'm going to tell you that I'm proud of you and I love you. So thanks yeah, for being a part of this. I love you too. To the rest of our, our fans out there. <laughs> Whooper fans. This is only the first stop on the Whooping Crane Chronicles. In this podcast series, I will have conversations with the scientists, artists, landowners, and others that I've met along my journey, who all have a shared connection with their love for whooping cranes. Stay tuned, and thank you for joining. Peace out, whooper snappers. Whoopersnappers.